Okay. So our speaker for today's webinar is Dr. Raymond, Raymond Cloud, who is a professor of entomology and extension specialist at Kansas State University. In this webinar, Dr. Cloyd will discuss the fundamentals of integrating pesticides with biological control agents to manage greenhouse insect and mite pests. I also want to uh, introduce uh, my colleague, Jason Lania, who is helping with the uh, webinar today. And Jason will be reading the, your questions uh, to Dr. Cloyd after the webinar. If, Hello, you have, if you have any question during the webinar, please type it on the question box on your control panel. After the presentation, Jason will read your questions and Dr. Cloyd will answer the questions. Without further ado, here is Dr. Cloyd to continue with, with the webinar. Raymond is all yours now. Well, thank you very much. I'd like to thank Jeffrey and Jason um, for inviting me to speak to you. This is what your speaker looks like. And the background is not Kansas, that's Italy, Venice, the Pacific. When I was visiting there many years, many years ago. Uh, what I want to talk about today, oops, come on, Ray. What I want to talk about today in this lunchtime greenhouse webinar is a very complex topic called using biological control and pesticides together to manage greenhouse insect and mite pest. Can it be done? And there's some of my information uh, regarding my responsibilities, professor of a research extension at Kansas State University. I handle all the horticultural crops. So let me give you a preview or overview of what you can expect during this webinar. I'm gonna give you a brief introduction. We're gonna talk about some of the biological control agents, often referred to as natural enemies. Then I'm gonna discuss the effects of pesticides on biological control agents. And then at the end, we'll have any questions and further or more elaborate discussions. So in greenhouse production systems, growing horticultural crops, Many of these crops are susceptible to a wide range of insect and mite pests, such as aphids, fungus net larvae, and spider mites, and many times simultaneously. That is, you're not dealing with one pest, but maybe you're dealing with two and possibly three. Well, the major way to deal with these insect and mite pests is the use of pesticides. Now, what I'll be talking about is insecticides and miticides. The primary means of dealing with these insect or mite pests are applications of these insecticides and miticides. And insecticides and miticides are fairly cost effective. They are effective overall in killing a wide variety of insect or mite pests. And there's a psychological feeling that after you've sprayed, you have wiped out, nuked, or eliminated all the insect or mite pests, although that's not true. Well, there have been some issues involved with using pesticides in greenhouse production systems, which has led to the implementation or increased use of an, another strategy called biological control. It's an alternative plant protection strategy that involves using good insects or mites to kill the bad insects or mites. And this is an example of a parasitoid killing an aphid and a predatory mite eating a two-spotted spider mite. Those of you that are involved in WW wrestling, you might kind of relate to this image. But what is biological control? Biological control is the use of biological control agents, again, natural enemies, such as parasitoids and predators that are released into greenhouses to regulate insect or mite pest populations. And the key term there is regulation. Biological control agents will not eradicate an insect or mite pest population. So the success of a biological control program is contingent on maintaining these insect or mite pest numbers at levels low enough to minimize plant damage because these natural enemies need a certain level of pest to sustain their populations. 
Biological control is a preventative strategy. When you see aphids, thrips, mites, white flies on your plants, it's generally too late. You almost have to release these before you see the pest in order for the program to be effective. And again, the key is regulation of the insect or mite pest populations. Okay, everybody understand that? Well, let's talk about the types of biological control agents. Well, we have parasitoids, predators, and also beneficial nematodes. These are the three types. On the upper left is a parasitoid. This has, happens to be the Incarcia formosa, which is the parasitoid for the greenhouse whitefly. Here on the upper right is uh, Neocelis cucumeris, which is the predatory mite for Western flower thrips. And on the bottom right are beneficial nematodes. Uh, beneficial nematodes are very effective on against fungus ant larvae that reside in the growing medium. There are many different types of biological control agents or natural enemies commercially available. This just gives you a, a look at how these are shipped when you buy them. Of course, you wanna make sure that they're packaged properly and they're alive. Uh, science is settled in the fact that dead insects or mites will not kill live insects or mites. So you gotta make sure they're alive before you release them. Okay. Overall, there is a general interest in simultaneously using pesticides in conjunction with natural enemies. Let me provide some background behind this. This is an email I received in 2016, one of many I received probably between 400 or 500 per year, indicating, hi Raymond, I was wondering then what is you deem to be the safe time interval to apply persimilis? This is Phytocelis persimilis. This is the predatory mite right here that is used against two-spotted spider mite. After applications of pylon, oberon, or fluoromite, these are three different miticides. Thanks again, Seth. So these are some of the inquiries that are out there that I receive regarding using biological control agents in conjunction or integrating with pesticides. There's lots of information out here. This is an old publication written by uh, colleagues in California in the 60s, talking about the integration of chemical and biological control. Uh, this is a book chapter I wrote several years ago talking about that same subject. And then here's another book chapter I wrote talking about the indirects of pesticides on natural enemies. And some uh, colleagues of mine did a nice publication on the sublethal effects, which we will talk about. And then talking about the side effects uh, and integration and plant protection strategies and new opportunities for integrating biological control. So there's a lot of information that you can easily download from uh, university websites as PDFs, and you can obtain these and read them. However, when you look, this is one of my favorite images. This is the scientific research, but the application information uh, is much less utilized. And there's reason for that because of the complexity of implementing these types of programs. Well, I'm gonna ask lots of questions and here's the first two. Is it possible to use biological control agents in conjunction with pesticides? Ask that question. Second question, what are the benefits of using biological control agents in conjunction with pesticides? What are, what are the benefits? We'll talk about some. Why should this be considered? And more importantly, is it cost effective? Okay, so in the back of your mind, uh, be thinking of these questions as we proceed through the presentation. So is it realistic to use pesticides in conjunction with biological control agents, or does it just make the job of growing plants much more difficult? That's a question that you in the audience have to answer. So now let's start getting into some meat and potatoes. What are the direct and indirect effects associated with using both biological control and pesticides? Well, let's talk about the, the effects. There are direct effects. Those are associated with mortality due to direct exposure to the pesticide. These effects may depend on the pesticide type, formulation, the rate used, 
the biological control agent type, whether it be a parasitoid or predator, the life stage, egg, larva, pupa, or adult exposed, and or the length of exposure time. Then there are what we call the indirect effects. Those impact physiology and behavior, such as developmental time, survival or longevity, prey consumption, parasitism, mobility, the sex ratio, origin behavior, and reproduction. Okay, so the pesticides that may directly or indirectly impact biological control agents include insecticides, miticides, and even fungicides. Fungicides are used to uh, deal with diseases, in this case, fungi. And so the question is, when I apply those, are those, are those going to have any direct or indirect effects on my biological control agents? We're going to address that. So here's a label. This is conserve, and they state on their label, other than reducing the target pest species as a food source. And I want to stop here. That is extremely important. Other, so they're sort of downplaying it, and we'll come back to that. But conserve does not significantly impact, they don't tell you directly or indirectly, the natural predaceous orthopod complexes, including ladybird beetles, lacewings, minute pirate bugs, and predatory mites. So what you're seeing on many labels is these materials stating whether they have direct impact on natural enemies or not. But I also think it's important for you to understand is that the direct or indirect effects of pesticides may be either due to the active ingredient, in this case, avamectin, avid, or the inert or inert ingredients. Now, these are not on the label, but they contain adjuvants, surfactants, degreasers, and other compounds that have shown to be harmful to a number of biological control agents. So not only do we have to look at the af actual active ingredient, but we have to be concerned about how these other or inert ingredients may impact our biological control program. Got that? Okay, so there are guides out there talking about the side effects, and this is one by Copert. Uh, what's in these things? Well, if you look at this, there's a rating, Toxicity on Natural Enemies, developed by the International Organization of Biologic Control. It's from one to four. One meaning non-toxic, less than 25% direct mortality, up to toxic over 75%. Now, I have some issues with this, and we're trying to revise this, but for the time being, uh, this is what we have to work with. So how do you interpret this? Well, if you open the guide, you'll see this is Amblyseus degenerans, and the pesticides acephate orthene, acetamiprid tristar, and acequinosol would be shuttled. So the nymph and the adult, you can see as a spray, as a four, 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 all three of them have over 75% over mortality. And then they talk about persistence, about five weeks for each one. And so this is how the rating scale looks like. Now, if you open up the catalog, to the very back, you'll see the listing of the major natural enemies and then all the pesticides. And you can see there's a lot of fours, which is over 75% mortality, but you'll also see a lot of vacant no information, okay? So the value of this is somewhat questionable uh, at this point. And like I said, we're gonna do our best to try to uh, re redesign it and make it more valuable for people such as greenhouse producers like yourself. Okay, so when you look at the types of natural enemies, the parasitoids generally are more sensitive, susceptible to pesticides than the predators. E even water can be harmful. Predators, on the other hand, are generally less sensitive or susceptible to pesticides, and this includes the life stages, the larva, nymph, and the adult. Now, this again is a general statement. Some of your predators uh, are very sensitive to certain, at, to certain pesticides, whereas some parasitoids, they're a little more tolerant than others. So how do pesticides negatively impact biological control agents? These are the four ways they do that. 
direct contact, residue repellency, indirect and sublethal effects, and prey elimination. So directed sprays of pesticides may kill natural enemies, or in the case of parasitoids, larvae may be killed or harmed while developing inside the prey. Okay, very easy to understand. Direct spraying, and, and it kills them. What about residual or repellency? Although spray applications of pesticides may not directly kill the biological control agents, any residues may have repellent activity. Many pyrethroids, such as Tallstar, Bifenthrin, Cyfluthrin, and others that are available, uh, they repel insects away from areas. Well, consequently, this can affect the ability of parasitoids and predators to locate a viable food source. They'll just go away from the area and either starve or die or find prey in another area. So I wrote an article several years ago entitled Repellency of Pesticides Impact on Natural Enemies. Uh, and you, you can go to uh, Google and, and download it and get some further reading about how certain pesticides can repel natural, natural enemies or biological control agents from the area. Okay, what about the indirect or sublethal effects? This is a little bit different. It involves the pesticides not directly killing the biological control agent, but they can affect reproduction by sterilizing females, reducing the ability of females to lay eggs, or even impact the sex ratio. When you get biologicals, you want much more females and males because it's the females that are attacking from a parasitoid standpoint, laying eggs either in the white flies or aphids. In addition, foraging efficiency, efficacy, and consumption rate may be altered, which influences the ability of a parasitic predator to find or locate the prey and also regulate the pest populations. Got it? So again, certain biological control agents host feed. What that means is the adult will feed on the nymph or larva as a viable food source, or they'll test it to see if it's a quality host for her offspring. And the greenhouse wildlife parasitoid Incarcer formosa does host feed. But during the host feeding process, if they consume residues of the insecticide, well, that may make it unacceptable. And they will not lay an egg. And if they don't kill it directly through host feeding, it'll survive. So what are the biological parameters that may be impacted by exposure to pesticides? Longevity of survival is really important. And in our research, I'll show you some of the uh, work we've done. Host acceptance, reproduction, foraging behavior, sex ratio. Remember, you want a high female to male sex ratio. And then percent emergence for parasitoids. The last one is prey elimination. Now, remember that conserve label? They said that they, it reduces the number of individuals for the biocontrol agent. Well, if biological control agents don't have a sufficient number of individuals to sustain their populations, they can starve, die, or leave the vicinity. So the pesticides may kill the prey, thus leading to the biological control agents either starving, dying, or leaving and they're unable to locate additional prey. Very, very important to understand that. Okay, now what I want to talk about is integrating biological control agents with biopesticides. And is this a plant protection strategy possible and cost effective? The reason I'm focusing in on this is that there's a lot of misperceptions or misinformation indicating that biopesticides can be used in conjunction with, with natural enemies or biological control agents. Well, what's a biopesticide? There are three classes. There are microbial pesticides. Those are microorganisms such as bacteria, fungi, viruses, or protozoa. They're highly selective in activity against specific insect pests. There's plant incorporated protectants and biochemical pesticides. 
Well, I'm going to focus in on this, the microbial pesticides, because that's what's most relevant in the greenhouse industry. So here is a listing of the insecticides commercially available based on entomopathogenic organisms, fungi, or bacteria. The ones in the color white are all beneficial fungi. You probably recognize some of these names, Botanigard, uh, No Fly, Ancora, and MIT-52. The ones in yellow are bacteria, and I'm sure you're, you can probably recognize some of these. Natrol for fungus gnats, Dipel for caterpillars, and some of the newest ones called Grandivo and Venerate. Now, Conserve is kind of a mixture, but it's more of a sort of bacterial type of compound. Remember that bacteria have to be consumed to be effective, whereas fungi can directly penetrate the cuticle or skin of the insect and then get inside and, inf and cause an infection. Well, what are the potential benefits of integrating biological control agents with pesticides? This is very important. Number one, you can reduce pesticide inputs, which may reduce or mitigate the risk of pesticide resistance because you're reducing the frequency of application. And that's very critical when we talk about pesticide resistance developing in insect or mite pest populations. So that's number one. Number two is less risk of phytotoxicity or harm to plants. Number three, which is very important, is safer work environment for employees. Remember, these biopesticides are specific for insects. There's no harm directly or indirectly to humans or pets. They're that specific. Number four, less pesticide residues on plant material. And number five, are there synergistic effects when integrating biological control agents with biopesticides? Well, what I mean by synergistic effects is when you're using biopesticides in conjunction with the biological control agents, do you get better control or suppression of the pest population than if you use either one individually? Okay, so that's what synergism or synergistic, synergistic effects means. The success of integrating biological control agents with biopesticides depends on spatial space and temporal time interactions. And these are associated with timing of the biological control agent releases and the timing of biopesticide applications. And I'll cover that more in detail when I highlight some of our research. So any direct or indirect effects related to entomopathogenic fungi, I'll focus on fungi, on biological control agents is contingent on the concentration, the rate you're using, the biological control agent type, whether it be a parasitoid or predator, the life stage exposed, whether it be egg, larva, nymph or adult, or pupa, timing of application, which I mentioned in the previous image, and then the environmental conditions. Remember that entomopathogenic fungi like plant pathogenic fungi rely on temperature and relative humidity for sporulation and survival and infection. So what are some of the issues with integrating biological control agents with pesticides? Well, number one is food availability. Any changes in the populations due to the biopesticide applications may reduce the availability of food sources. That is, if the biopesticide kills 90% of the pest, there may not be enough for any parasitoids and predators to sustain their populations, thus indirectly affecting subsequent biological control agents. The number two is the avoidance. Predatory bugs may avoid consuming prey infected by a biopesticide. Now that's not bad because if the predatory bug leaves it alone, the insect pest is gonna die anyway from the biopesticide. So in both cases, the prey search time increases, predation rates decrease, and efficacy may be reduced. That makes sense? Okay, let's get into more in depth of the issues and talk about practicality. So number one, the host is treated with a biopesticide, in this case, an entomopathogen fungus. The prey may not be acceptable as a food source for prey or predators, especially those that host feed, okay? 
Number two, parasitoids may avoid laying eggs into infected hosts of prey. Well, that makes sense. If the entomal pathogenic fungus is already infecting the pest, then why have the parasitoid lay an egg when it's gonna die anyway? So it should move on to one that's not being affected by the biopesticide. Number three, the biopesticide may outcompete immature parasitoids developing inside host prey. That could be detrimental. And then number four, parasitoids may be negatively affected by a biopesticide when developing inside an infected host. So here we have an Eremosterous parasitoid, female. She's intonating. She's checking to make sure that that white fly nymph or larva is a quality source for her offspring. But if the entomopathogenic fungus has changed the composition of that nymph or larva, she may not accept it and she'll move on. Well, that's okay because the white fly is going to die anyway from the biopesticide and the parasitoid can search out white flies that are not being affected by the biopesticide. So number five, during searching, parasitoids and predators may encounter free canidia fungal canidia and on plants and subsequently become infected. So as they're moving and these canidia on the, or spores are on the leaf, uh, they themselves may be infected and may subsequently be impacted either directly or indirectly. That's not a good situation. Number six, the predators may ingest spores of the entomopathogenic fungi when consuming infected prey this compromising efficacy, that's not a good situation. And then number seven, multiple pest complexes may influence the interactions between biological control agents and biopesticides. When you're dealing with more than one pest, then the system becomes more complex. You're having to maybe release two natural enemies or biological control agents. And then there you have to ask yourself the question, how do these biopesticides impact both of the biological control agents simultaneously? Okay, so the biological control agents may ingest fungal spores when grooming. Insects are extremely clean. Uh, this is a parasitoid called Leptomastix dactylopi. It's a parasitoid of uh, citrus mealybug. And she will use her legs to rub off any material. She uses that to indicate the quality of the prey uh, and things, items on the leaf like trichomes. But if she ingests some of the spores that are attached to antenna, she could be negatively affected. Although that will be contingent or depend on the spore concentrations that are present and the amount she ingests. So here's a, a, a ladybird beetle feeding on a prey. So predators may not accept a host treated with a biopesticide, such as an entomopathogenic fungus, or predators may ingest spores while consuming the host. So they will be directly or indirectly affected. Uh, so they die as well as the pest dies. For those of you that want more information, I did write an article for uh, everybody in the greenhouse industry. I believe it's in Greenhouse Product News called The Impact of Beneficial Fungi on Natural Enemies. And it gets much more into detail than I can cover in, in this presentation uh, for the webinar. Okay, so how can you avoid problems associated with using biological control agents with pesticides. And it comes back to timing of the applications, in this case, the biopesticides, and timing of releases of the biological control agents. However, so what I'm gonna cover for the remainder of the presentation is some of our research we've done at Kansas State University to address these questions to help you understand how some of these products directly or indirectly affect natural enemies or biological control agents. However, before I do that, I think we need to go over some poll questions. Thank you, Ray. Uh, so everyone, we are going to have four questions and I just want to let you know that this is not a quiz, so you don't have to panic, but it's very important that, especially if you need pesticide credit credits to answer these questions.
So that come, there comes the first question. So I'm going to close that and we go to the next question. That's the next question, second question. So I close that. So we're going to go to the third question. Okay, I'm closing that. Fourth question. Fifth question. That's the last question.
Thank you for all for answering the questions. Uh, Ray, Maud, you can continue with the presentation. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. Um, I'm sure everybody uh, got all of them right. Uh, we could go over those later if we have time. So what I wanna talk about now is some of our research that we've done uh, regarding the effects, both direct and indirect, on certain biological control agents. And so the first one, whoops, did you give me? Okay, uh, the first one is roe beetle. Uh, on the top is the adult, on the bottom is the larva. These are excellent predators of fungus and larva in the pupal stages of Western flower thrips. Uh, they reside in the growing medium, I've uh, been rearing them for probably close to 15 years. So let me just show you how we do these experiments. Well, these are the experimental setups. These are what we call deli squat containers. They're about 473 mils. They're about the same size as a four inch pot. And we put growing medium in them and we inoculate them with the roe beetle adults. And then we would make our treatments. Now we put yellow sticky cards on top to capture the adults. However, we know we're not gonna get all of them. So what we do, or I should say my graduate students and assistants do, they take all the growing media out and they just count the number of, of live roe beetle adults. So uh, when we look at the data, which I'll show you, the y-axis is always going to be the number of live roe beetle adults, zero to 20, and then the x-axis is gonna be the treatment. So in this first set of data, what I wanted to highlight is the blue bar is releasing the adults before we made the application. And the this bar, uh, dark red bar, is after we made the application. So natural, which is Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis, which is a bacteria for fungus at larva, uh, had no direct impacts compared to the water control on roe beetle adults. Okay, on the bottom, you can see that all the neonicotinoids, arena, safari, and flagship were extremely harmful directly to roe beetle adults. Okay, so when you're out there, you're growing your crop, you also have to apply fungicides. So in this set of data, what we looked at were three soil applied fungicides, Heritage, Elliot, and Subdumax. We also looked at MET52, Metarizium, and then water control. So let's say, for example, you're using row beetles to regulate your fungus and that larva populations, and it looks like you might have some Pythimer phytophthora. So the question is, if I apply those fungicides, will they compromise my biological control program for fungus gnat larva? And the answer is no. We found out that none of the treatments that we use based on statistical analysis uh, had any direct impacts on adult row beetles. So that's, that's good information. So from a standpoint of practicality, that would be a realistic uh, sense of using fungicides uh, to deal with the plant pathogen, but having no impact on the natural enemy or biological control agent, in this case, the roll beetle on fungus ant larva. Okay, so this is another set of data, and I want to highlight B base, that's Bavaria bassiana, that's Botanigard. And so one of the general results we've always seen is that pesticides have less direct effects on biological control agents when they're released after the pesticides are applied. And you can see the blue bar is after, whereas the gray bar is before. And that does make sense because that reduces the exposure of the roe beetle adults to, in this case, the various insecticide treatments. We also have looked at various formulations of azadiractin, azatrol, Moltex and Azagard, and Spiritetramet, which is sold as Contos. And the bottom line is none of the treatments, regardless of the application timing, had any indirect effects on roll beetle adults. So that's, that's good news. Okay, now we move into some of our research with the second biological control agent we rear, and that's insidious flower bug, also known as the Oris insidiosus, okay? Uh, this is not life size, it's a close up. Uh, they're much smaller than this. So, what 
Aureus does. It inhabits the same environment as Western flower thrips adults. This is a Gerber daisy flower, and the thrips adults like these types of flowers, but Aureus will also, especially the adults, inhabit that same uh, environment. So what happens to Aureus and Cidiosis populations when these pesticides are applied? And that was our uh, general objective or question we want to address with the next series of experiments. Well, let me just briefly go over the materials and methods so you have an idea how these are conducted. These are worst case scenarios. If they survive this trial, they're gonna survive in the greenhouse. So we use Petri dishes. We were testing various pesticides. The Oris insidiosa's adults are one to four days old. The Petri dishes are lined with filter paper. And then a one mil aliquot of the pesticide is applied, distributed throughout the filter paper. And then what we do, provide bee pollen as a food source. And then what we do is we evaluate after 24, 40, 72, and 96 hours, how many survive. So this is looking at the direct effects of these pesticides on the adult stage of oris insidiosis. So what we were looking was a whole lot of pesticides, but I wanted to highlight the beneficial fungi and the beneficial bacteria that we also included in the trial. And we also looked at spinosin. Okay, in addition to direct effects, we can look at indirect effects. And so after 96 hours of exposure, the surviving Aureus insidiosis adults are transferred to new Petri dishes with 20 adult Western flower thrips. This will give us an idea, even though it didn't kill them, did it have any impact on their predation rate? So the Petri dishes were wrapped in parafilm, and then after 48 hours, we counted the number of Western flower thrips adults killed. So these are the results from the direct effects. You can see the Bavari bassiana from 24 to 96, no direct effects, 100% survival. Metarizium anisoplia, which is now called brunium, also was fairly non-toxic or had minimal toxicity, 80% survival after 96 hours. Well, Grandivo was about 60% survival from 24 to 96, and then conserve after 96 hours, we had only 20% survival, okay? Was that due to the active or possibly the inerts? That's, one, that's a question that we uh, continue to address. So our next experiment or the final one I'll talk about, the materials and methods were pretty much the same. Overall, pesticides, age of the adults, Petri dishes, and again, looking at survivability after 24, 48, 72, and 96 hours. So what we were looking at here were fungicides. We looked at Aliet, Heritage, Decree, and Cygnus. Now Cygnus is no longer available. Um, it was when we did the trial, but we also looked at some of the same materials that we looked at in the first trial uh, I showed you. And again, they're, they're spinosad. So, also, we did indirect effects. You can look at direct, but boy, you have to also look at indirect effects at the same time. What we found that all the fungicides had none to minimal direct effects. Heritage, 100%. Decree, 100%. Survival after 96 hours, and then 80% for both Allied and Cygnus. So this is good to know that if you're going to spray uh, your crop, that you're using aureus for biocontrol of Western flower thrips, you're not going to have or you're not going to compromise the success of that biological control program when you're spraying fungicides. So again, I wanted to highlight that you can see what we call um, the ones that are more harmful, including Abbott, Concern, Pylon, we're getting less than 20% survival. And so those could not be used in conjunction with Aureus insidiosis. However, I have to give you a caveat. But before I do that, I wanna tell you our overall conclusions. In general, 
the insect growth regulators as a directin, bupropazine, quinoprene, pyroproxifen, the botanicals in the entomopathogens, the very bassiana, metarizium anisoplia, but now brunium, and chromobacterium sutuga had none to minimal direct effects on oris and adult survival. Okay. However, abamectin, avid, spinosad conserve, pyridolidal overture, and chlorphenopure pylon did have direct effects on the adults after 96 hours, ranging from 20 to 60% adult survival. And then teflovalinate, a pyrethroid, and then the neonicotinoids, imidacloprid, dinotefuron, acetamiprid, and thiamethoxin, they were directly harmful to aureus insidiosus adults. None of the fungicides we tested had any major direct effects on aureus insidiosus. And then what was really interesting and important is the pesticides that demonstrated none to minimal direct effects did not indirectly affect the ability of aureus insidiosus adults to feed in Western flower thieves. So in addition to no direct effects, they had no indirect effects on the ability of aureus insidiosus to forage or feed on Western flower thips adults. And that is really important to know. However, when you're looking at laboratory green greenhouse, caution must be exercised when attempting to translate or interpret or infer laboratory tests regarding predictions associated with biologic control agents and their performance under greenhouse conditions. Laboratory tests may fail to take into account the indirect effects. Now, that's, that's what we're trying to do in the laboratory. However, the long-term evaluations conducted under greenhouse conditions would provide more practical information regarding any pesticide, pest, biological control agent, and plant interactions, okay? Um, we do those, but they're more expensive and time consuming. So uh, they are done, uh, but not at the same level as the laboratory bioassays experiments looking at direct and some indirect effects. So as we wrap up, is the use of biologic control agents with pesticides a viable pest management strategy? What do you think? Can biological control agents be used with pesticides? It depends. It depends. It's a case by case basis. Uh, I, I, I wanted to highlight how complex this is. Uh, it's definitely not a true yes or no decision. And so when you look at this as a fulcrum, biologic control on one end and pesticides in the other, ask yourself this question which plant protection strategy is most appropriate for your operation? Is it just biologic control? Is it just pesticides? Or is there some level in between the fulcrum that you might be able to use and feel comfortable with? So the two last questions are these. Is a pesticide or is a pesticide or will the bio is a pesticide needed? Or will the biological control agents regulate pest populations enough to avoid notice of plant damage? Do you need to intercede with the pesticide? And will that pesticide application enhance or disrupt the normal regulatory process? Okay, so if you go in with a pesticide that results in 90% mortality of the pest and has a substantial impact on survival, you're back to square zero. You know, so these are some of the decisions you have to make, and that's why there's uh, we're doing the research related to that, and others are too. So think, what is practical and cost-effective? Did you get that? So those of you that want more information, we uh, are working with Michigan State University Extension personnel. Heidi Lindbergh and I developed an online course called Biological, Biological Control for Greenhouse Growers, and it involves six units, and unit five is discussing interactions of pesticides and biologic control. So if you want more information, these are four hours of pre-recorded lecture. Um, there is a quiz. You get a certificate. 
And uh, if you get, if you do a Google for biological control for greenhouse growers, you can access the website uh, to register for the course. So I want to say I really appreciate your participation. This is not the same as uh, me standing up and talking to you and integrating and seeing your uh, your your faces, but uh, we we're doing the best we can. So that's all I have. And with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'd be happy to address any questions. Uh, Ray, this is Jason Lanier. We have no questions at this time. You must have done a perfect job presenting the material.